ad break time. The Beyond Solitaire podcast is proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations, and they've got something big going on. This spring, they will launch their Kickstarter campaign for 500-Year-Old Vampire, a cooperative RPG by Jason Cox that is fun with friends, but also written to national educational standards. I've personally played it and had a blast, so check it out. I also want to put in a quick plug for my own Patreon at patreon.com slash beyondsolitaire. After this year, I would like to devote my entire summer to doing games work instead of teaching summer school, and your support would help make that possible for me. For now, though, let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and this week on the pod, I have a very special guest. I've got Professor Nick Proctor. He is on the history faculty at Simpson College, and he is the executive director of the Reacting Consortium. In other words, he's the current big boss of Reacting to the Past. How you doing, Nick? Good. It's always good as one big boss to talk to another. <laughs> yeah, so you've now taken over as executive director of Reacting to the Past. You've got big shoes to fill. You know, we all love and respect Mark Carnes. And so how has that how has that been? And you know, are you are you doing some things to kind of remake things in your image? Are you maintaining what's there? You know, what's what's the scope? Well, largely I'm trying to maintain things, uh, because I think that Mark did a fantastic job. Um, one of the things that Mark uh, would like to talk about is how at each step of reacting's expansion from uh, elite college to regional state university to four-year college to high school, he was always the one who said, you know, I don't think it's going to work. Um, and then it worked. So I, I'm kind of continuing in that tradition by thinking that crazy ideas may work. So I'm really doing the best job that I can if I don't get in people's way, but instead I try to give them advice about where to take reacting next. And if I recall correctly, uh, reacting now has a new publisher. So where are reacting books being published at this time? Right. Our new publisher is university of North Carolina press, which is really good. We, we had an excellent relationship with WW Norton, but we decided to move to North Carolina because since it's a university press, the possibility of publishing games in the series that we're never going to make a profit fits much better with University of North Carolina's mission than with WW w. Norton's. Um, so as long as we have titles that are profitable, publishing titles that are not going to be profitable fits within their mission, so that which also fits within our mission. So it's a it's a better mesh in that way. Awesome. And just to ask, um, does publishing with a university press also affect, I guess, whether something's considered peer reviewed? Has the review process changed at all? The review process really hasn't changed much. The, the one thing that we do more intentionally than we used to is to have uh, anonymous double blind. That in the early days of reacting was really sort of silly because it was a small enough community that everybody sort of knew who everybody else was. So that would just be a fiction. But now the community has grown, grown enough that we can actually legitimately do that. That's part of UNC's procedure. So we just, we were already moving towards that. We just moved towards it a little faster than we might have otherwise. The, the one nice thing about that, because it's industry standard for academia, is it's become a touch easier for people to use reacting games as part of their promotion and tenure. Excellent. And so, I mean, I've had podcasts in this series about reacting to the past before, but for people who are listening for the first time, what is a reacting to the past game and why are they great? So a, a reacting to the past game is a role-playing game. It's a historical and it's driven by a historical situation. The, the best short definition of a reacting game that I've heard is it's ideas that clash. Um, so those ideas are clashing in a historical context, and they're informed by documents from the period. So it's it's sort of like um, probably the things that it's the closest to are mock trial and model UN. Um, but because it's historical, there's a lot more stabbing and many more riots. Both of which I'm very much in favor of in my classroom games as well. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to get enough. It's hard to get enough. 
<laughs> so when you talk about reacting to the past being an expanding community, uh, in what ways do you see it expanding? Um, is it moving just to more universities? Is it moving to high schools? You know, what kinds of communities are using reacting games now as part of their pedagogy? Yeah, for the past 10 years, the expansion of reacting has been pretty much a kind of a mathematical progression, um, a straight line, more or less moving like that. But it's achieved that by expanding into different areas. Right now, the biggest area of expansion, I think, is high schools. But most of the high schools that it's expanding into are privates or um, public residential high schools, which are which are sort of special in in different ways. Um, I think that sort of the next big achievement for reacting in terms of expanding, as well as expanding in undergraduate instruction in general, is going to be figuring out a way for games to work well in AP classes at the high school level. Um, for me, sort of a good AP class at the high school level is probably more academically demanding than a bad survey class at the undergraduate level. So I really see that as a permeable boundary um, and think that if if we're designing games to work in pretty much any college class, then surely they're going to work in a good AP class. Right. That makes a lot of sense. So you're... Um... You're the executive director of Reacting. Uh, that probably means that you have both played and designed a few Reacting games yourself, at least theoretically. No I'm kidding. Uh, so, what? Tell us about some of the Reacting games that you've done and are working on. Sure. Well, do you want to hear about ones that I've done or ones that I'm working on first? Ooh, do the summary of what you've done and then tell us where you're going. Okay. So the the first couple of Reacting games that I did, one is about the secession crisis that leads to the American Civil War. So that game is set in the Kentucky legislature, which I decided to do because when I would ask my students, which way did Kentucky go in the secession crisis? They were like, and I'm like, it's a slave state. And they're like, but you know, um, so Kentucky historically takes this really weird, weird pathway in that it's neutral. Like it officially declares its neutrality, which is pretty bizarre. Um, and it doesn't work. So uh, so I thought that Kentucky was a really good place to have those arguments because the students are not going to have a lot of preconceptions about who's going to win them. The other game that I did in the reacting series towards the beginning is called Forced Diplomacy, and that's a treaty negotiation between the Lenape or Delaware and the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois League and the colony of Pennsylvania. Um, and they're all arguing about what's going to happen to land and the war and all sorts of other things. So it's a, it's a big mess in terms of all of these different issues. But the way that the game is constructed is it's basically a big prisoner's dilemma game because at the end, the, both of the cultures go to separate spaces to decide whether or not they're gonna actually uphold the treaty agreement that they've spent the game hammering out. Um, so it often mm -hmm. has my favorite game moment where halfway through the negotiation, somebody comes up to me and is like, okay, I think we're pretty close to a deal. Who's gonna make sure that everybody actually does what they promised to do? And I'm like, um, no one? Uh, because they're sort of, they kind of like want the UN to come in or something like that, and to be like, okay. Um, but that's my favorite thing about the game is recognizing that any treaty agreement is only as good as people's willingness to uphold it. So that creates a, an interesting impact on the sort of win-lose, because if you really go for broke and you try to win everything, that means that you're accumulating losers who are all going to want to see the treaty collapse. So you sort of have to figure out how to win enough, but not too much, which is a, which just game wise is, is a real cool space to put players. Oh, that's so funny. Um, and, and I also feel like that makes 
this is the sort of thing that takes, I think, reacting beyond something like Model UN or Mock Trial because you can insert something that's more deliberately gamey into it. That very central problem, but you know, it's possible to break the rules. It's possible to have a little bit of a surprise. So have you continued to move in that direction in your in your current games that you're working on? Yeah, the the two games that I'm working on right now, one of them is set in Louisiana at the end of the Civil War, and is it's about the beginning of the Reconstruction era. Um, for that, it, it, well, actually, for both of the games that I'm working on, I've, I've borrowed a lot from board games. Uh, so the Reconstruction game, in a lot of ways, is a worker placement game, but it's a worker placement game with a couple dozen players, and they all argue about where they're going to place the workers. Um, and it's also a competing goods game in that all of the different places where they can place their workers, education, politics, self-defense, um, are things where they say, oh yeah, this is absolutely good, but it's they have to then prioritize because there aren't enough workers to place everywhere that needs a worker. Um, so, so that's been a place where playing board games and looking at board games has been really helpful for my design. The, the other is a game about the escalation of US involvement in Vietnam during the early 60s. And that's a, um, it's kind of a deck building game um, in that the cards are all different policies that the US can enact. But it's a deck building game where you don't ever know what your opponent's deck looks like. You just have to react to the things that happen because of what your opponent is doing. Oh, that's really interesting. Very. So um, actually, I could take these questions in a couple directions, but I want to start with a mechanical question, and then I want to move back to something more like chunky and historical. Uh, how, how easy would you say it is for a teacher other than yourself to implement these reacting games that have these board gamey elements because I feel like I would be super down for that. I also play a lot of board games. Um, if you've got somebody just teaching and has never really done this before, but wants to maybe dip in and this is the right topic for them, uh, how accessible are they going to find running this with their classes? Yeah, this is an excellent question and and why I have a kind of a stop me before I kill again attitude towards game design. Um, I, I really strive to make the games as, as playable off the shelf as possible. And some of that is because I spent 10 years as chair of the editorial board. And a lot of what you do in that position is talk to authors who have things in their head and convince them that they have not yet sufficiently put the things in their head on paper. So I, I try to not be a problem author in that way and, and spell it all out so that somebody else can play it. Um, that said, that experience has also taught me that even the most astute author underestimates how confusing their game is. Um, so that's where multiple play tests and peer readings are really helpful so that I can get a sense of where have I made it too complicated? Where have I made it too gamey? Um, and both of those games as they've been in development, both of them have been played by other people now they're simpler than they were going into the process. Um, and I think some of that, you know, it's it's the historian creeping in where you're like, oh, you know, Cambodia is cool. We've got to include a whole bunch of stuff about Cambodia in here. Um, and then in playing the, running the game in my own classes and talking to people who beta tested it for me, it was like, well, you know, Cambodia never came up in my game. Or it seems like the issues in Cambodia look a lot like the issues in Laos. So I'm not sure why that's in the game. So now, apologies to Cambodians, um, like Cambodia is not in that game anymore uh, in an effort to make it more usable. Got it. So some editorial choices must be made. Yeah. Brutal. So the other thing I noticed is that these games are all on pretty tough topics in the United States. So reconstruction, not an easy topic. Secession, not an easy topic. Um, those, those are understatements. Um, negotiations with Native Americans, also tough. And, uh, you know, Vietnam is still 
very, very touchy as well. So how do you build in, I guess, some safety guards mm -hmm. for things getting a little too wild or a little too, you know, kind of nasty in classes where students are role playing as people who did and said awful things. And also, um, you know, how do you prepare students to embody things that they may not feel comfortable with? This is a great question. And I think that it's really the biggest question for reacting um, and has been for about the past five years and is gonna be going forward into the future. For me, um, the solution to this looks different from game to game. So in the Kentucky game, the secession game, for example, in, in that, it's really important to not whitewash the history, right? Um, and racism is one of the driving forces behind secession. So at the same time, I, I didn't want to ask or require students to make racist arguments um, and act like they're trying to convince their peers with them. Um, so the way that, or like really be trying to convince their peers with them, which would be even worse. Um, <laughs> So the way that that game deals with it is before the game starts, everybody takes a 10 question quiz. And the quiz is over the most racist elements of the documents that the game is based upon. Anybody who gets a perfect score on that quiz um, then gets a token. And the token says, congratulations, you've shown your mastery of mid 19th century American racism you can use this token to double your vote on any issue um Ooh. and the, but but only once so that so that the point that that makes is is one that people from across the political spectrum utilize racist arguments um unionists make racist arguments secessionists make racist arguments all of these people in the legislature make racist arguments um, second, it shows the power of the racist argument. This can double your vote, which is a pretty big deal, uh, especially if it's a smallish class. The, the third one is you can double this vote on any issue. Um, and I think that this was the surprising thing for me when I was doing the primary source research for the game is finding out that it's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go to the legislature and talk about building a canal. Guess what? I've got a racist argument for that. Or, oh, I want to issue bonds and get the state legislature to vote on those. Hey, I'm going to use a racist argument to get that done. So I think that students sort of assume racism equals Confederate, only they're using it, and they're only using it for questions about secession and slavery. Um, but it's just a broad spectrum tool that politicians of every stripe are using in Kentucky at this time. So, so that's why I've abstracted it that way. It's a real powerful factor in the game, but in that game in my class, if, if somebody starts venturing into the territory of racist rhetoric, it's one of the rare times when I'll come in as the game master and I'll be like, hey, like, are you making, are you using the racist argument at this point? Because if you are, you should play the race card and double your vote and get on with the rest of your argument. And if you're, if you don't have a race card, you're not an acknowledged master of 19th century racism. So you can't use it because like, you're not going to convince anybody in this room. So why bother? Um, right. And that seems to work pretty well for that game for the, for the other games. It's different though. Yeah. I will say, I also do like that because it enables you to make those arguments without actually having to make them. And it also, I guess, simulates people accepting those arguments without somebody having to actually role play accepting the argument. Well, and without everybody having to listen to the argument. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I want everybody to need to read the argument. Yes. Because sort of seeing these people of different political persuasions making racist arguments of one kind or another I think it's really important for them to recognize just how soaked in this rhetoric American politics is in 1860. And if they walked away from the game thinking like, oh, this is all about tariffs, 
I, you know, that's, that is a big fail for me. Yeah, that's very fair. Uh, have you ever had a student express discomfort with the content of a game? And if so, how did you help them work through it and engage? Yeah, you know, and this is a thing that, well, because I teach in Central Iowa, so I'm I'm in the Midwest nice zone. Um, I have never had a student express discomfort vocally, mm -hmm. but I've had students clearly experiencing discomfort through their body language or their engagement in the game. Um, so for these reasons, I, I, I think that I've adopted a couple of practices that are probably just generally good. One is I try to now give a, a questionnaire before I assign roles to sort of see what kind of roles people gravitate towards. I'm just starting the Greenwich Village game. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to check in there, particularly because in Iowa right now, access to abortion is a fraught political issue. You know, I want to make sure that I've got somebody playing Margaret Sanger. Yeah. Who is going to be able to play Margaret Sanger well. Um, and that's not automatically everybody in my classroom. So, uh, so I think questionnaires are good for things like that. The other thing that I do much more consciously now than when I started doing reacting is to spend time before the game starts setting ground rules for the interaction. Um, having a safety sign, um, having a shared idea about how do you step away from a conversation that's making you uncomfortable for one reason or another. Um, do we need to ever do a reset as a class because something has happened? Um, so just various things like that. There are a whole bunch of tools. Um, and I think that I recognize now in a way that I didn't before that investing the time at the outset to make sure that everybody in the class understands those tools is really an important part of, of having a good learning experience for everybody in the classroom. Right. And I'm just going to ask it because we're here, we're now, we're living in modern America. Um, you know, you are confronting really tough issues through these games in your classroom that are so difficult for some of us that uh, we have politicians trying to discuss what should and shouldn't be discussed in classrooms, uh, in high schools especially, but also in some public colleges. Um, you know, how are you approaching your work with that kind of thought in the water right now? Uh, or are you just continuing on and doing what you do? Well, I, th I think but I think both of those, because uh, again, working with the university press and the attitude of reacting in the past is we see role playing games as a way to confront tough history that traditional approaches are sometimes not as effective at. Uh, and so we're so we're not trying to steer away from particular topics. We are, I think, consciously trying to steer away from particular approaches to role playing. Um, so asking somebody, so for example, we've got a new game coming out, which is about the Weimar Republic in Germany. And there are members of the Nazi party in the game. So we had many, many discussions about like, well, how do we do this? So thing number one, that we decided was the way that democracy falls apart in Weimar Germany in the 19, late 1920s and early 30s, like that's a history that students should understand. <laughs> how, how do fascists come to power? Yeah. Is a worthwhile set of historical information to be familiar with, um, both on an, on an intellectual level, but also in um, the kind of displaced experience of role playing, like, like um, you know, how does that feel on some level? Um, on the other hand, having somebody articulating Nazi ideology to its fullness in the classroom is like the racists that I was talking about for the Kentucky game. That is a recipe for disaster on all kinds of levels, right. institutional, individual, et cetera, et cetera. 
So part of putting that game together and working with the author, who Robbie Goodrich, she's a great guy, was figuring out how to provide instructors with a number of options for how to deal with that. Um, so, so that's a game now that has several different ways to approach including that in your game. One of those being for anti-Semitism in particular, anti-Semitism is not going to be part of the played game at all. You're just going to encounter that in the texts right. before the game, but it's you're not going to articulate that. On the other end is players are allowed to articulate anti-Semitic uh, ideas provided that they're grounded in the history. That's not an option that I would take, um, but we wanted to put that option in there um, with sort of cautions. This might not be for you because um, because we we didn't want to to potentially whitewash it. Right. Yeah. Like there's always that tension, I think, between am I enacting something harmful in my classroom and am I am I painting over something or am I, you know, restricting an educational experience because I'm uncomfortable? Like what? Yeah. You have to, that's a whole range of questions that. You know, and, you know. and even in doing that in terms of, of pushback about one thing or another that people are encountering in different institutions in different States, e even before that, my philosophy was always not every reacting game is going to work at every school. And not every reacting game is going to work in every classroom at that school. I, I think that there was a conversation that I was part of early days in reacting where there was um, a game about the creation of Israel. And somebody said, yeah, we couldn't play this at Columbia. Like it, 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 it just, it's too third rail. Um, mm -hmm. And there was another person there from the Midwest, from a small school in the Midwest, who said, oh yeah, we would have zero problem playing a creation of Israel game at my school. The game that's problematic, it's the one about Ann Hutchinson because I'm at a, right, right. Yeah, that's, the, that's what I did. I was like, how's that? <laughs> because the denomination that his school is affiliated with, antinobianism, which is the kind of obscure Christian theological concept uh, behind Ann Hutchinson. He's like, that's a big deal in my denomination. So we really couldn't play an Ann Hutchinson game on my campus. Oh, that is so wild. Yeah. So the, a game that seems innocuous to you might not seem that way to me and vice versa. So really what we try to do in terms of the off the shelf playability is to make sure that the instructor is given a heads up about these are the issues that are gonna come up in this game um, and be aware of them and then make an informed decision about whether this is a good fit for your class. I, I'm not gonna tell everybody you should always use a game anywhere you can and that's gonna be better because I, it's just not. I mean, fair enough. So we talked a lot about reacting, but I do want to uh, give attention to the fact that you do other kinds of classroom games, including one, if I recall correctly, about, is it about interpreting historical texts? Yeah, yeah. There's, well, there there are a couple little ones that, that I did. There's one called Making History. Um, sometimes it's called the breakup game, which is a, <laughs> which is a story about two people who broke up. Uh, and so for that, I'd, I, I, it's a good first day icebreaker kind of a thing. And what it's there to get students to realize is that history is more complicated than what they think, because usually they come in and they're like, you open the big book of history and then you memorize some stuff. Um, historians have agendas. Um, sources are all problematic. Um, and so for that, through a series of things, people get little colored cards that give you information about the two people that broke up. And basically what they do over the course of the game is they try to put together a compelling hypothesis about why they broke up. So things that they do is they, they start making narratives. Like even if they're trying not to, they put things into narrative form. Uh, they start distrusting certain sources and privileging other sources. 
they start realizing that they all have a personal theory of breakups that they use to fill in the gaps between the sources. Um, so it's hilarious fun because it's about two college students breaking up um, and it's super accessible. But really what it is, is the first two chapters of E.H. Carr's On History in Game 4. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, do they ever get an actual answer to the breakup? Or is the point of the game that they uh, just have to settle for what they know and interpret it? Yeah, that's that's the latter, um, which is frustrating for some of them. It's But, but it's... Uh, and I think that one of the questions that I like to ask when we're playing it is, okay, if you can't have a definitive answer, are you going to refrain from trying to provide an answer at all? And they're always like, well, no, because we, we, we want to know why they broke up. And it's like, exactly. But you're never going to know for sure. Um, and if you get a new source or new information? Are you going to be open to that? And they're like, yeah. And and then, I mean, the thing that makes me happy as a historian is I'm like, is it probably good to look at more than one or two sources before you come to a conclusion? And they're all like, oh, it is assuredly so. Uh, and then a couple weeks into the semester, when we're doing a more traditional thing, I remind them of that as I'm like, well, didn't we all agree that it was better to look at more than a couple of sources before you come to an informed hypothesis? And they're like, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, it sounds like the answer is yes, but do you find that having played this game changes um, the way that your students engage with history throughout the semester after you've, after you've broken the ice this way? I think so. It, it, well, the thing that I, it's difficult for me to distinguish is, is there a change in the way that they engage with history or is there a change in the way that they engage in the class? Mm. Um, so I think that in terms of it, it definitely changes the way that they engage in the class because it's sort of this fun, ridiculous thing, but it has something, it's not an icebreaker in the traditional sense, which usually isn't connected to what the rest of the class is. It's, it's an on topic icebreaker. Um, so that usually means that they're more open and loose with their class participation. Um, and they also, okay, well, maybe I'm talking myself into thinking that they do come at history because the very first day, if I'm going, there is not a definitive answer to this question. That, that sets a tone for the rest of the semester that we're doing something other than looking for definitive answers. Answers, which mm. is often the way I think that K through 12, they've approached history. You know, the answer is C on the multiple choice test, you know, like it has to be. Yeah, that's actually something that I encounter often in my own classes. So I teach Latin at the high school level, and I work really hard to not ask my students too many questions that are just yes, no. Um, but there's a certain transactional nature to school when you have to pass certain tests and kind of get through certain thresholds and you know one thing i really like about games in my own classroom is that it breaks that up it makes it harder to determine what is being assessed am i being assessed right now like do i have to do this uh actually do you get students who see this initial activity and they they blow it off because they don't want to take it seriously or because it's about a breakup is it usually so compelling they can't help themselves it's it's usually so compelling that they can't help themselves but for for gaming in the classroom in general is I I find that I get I get pushback from two different populations that are pretty different. I, I get pushback from one population um, that doesn't want to do anything. So I've sort of violated the ceasefire that they maybe have enjoyed between teachers and students, where the teachers don't ask them to do much and the students in return don't do much. Um, and this makes everybody's life easier if education is not actually your objective. Right. So they don't like gaming because it puts them on the spot and other people are coming around asking them things and uh, expecting them to vote in informed ways or whatever. So, so they don't like it. Um, the other group that's kind of an identifiable population that gives pushback sometimes are honor students. Because they figured out how to school 
and they school really well. And what I'm tossing at them is something that is not school in the way that they have come to traditionally understand it. And they're, they're worried because I am endangering their GPA because they know very well how to go through the hoops and jump over the hurdles in traditional classes. And, it, and those hoops and hurdles are not visible to them. So they're like, uh, am I being assessed here? Because however I'm being assessed, I really need an A. Um, and where I'm like, well, I'm not assessing the outcome of the game. I'm assessing your engagement in the game. And they're just like, I do not understand what you're saying. <laughs> What, I can't just write an essay my way out of this? <laughs> right, right. No, I've had students say, like, instead of playing the game, can I write a research paper? Because, because I, you know, and I have some sympathy for that because it's, it is weird if you've never done something like that before. And if you and your family take your GPA super seriously, I can see how it could create a lot of anxiety. Um, so I, I, I don't blow those students off. I, I, I try to engage them and talk through like, well, this is what I mean by engage. Um, but, uh, but they often struggle with it because it's it because they do not know how to master it. And it's like yeah. double frustrating when I'm like, there might not be a way to master it. And they're like, well, I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> I think that actually may be the, my favorite thing that I discovered in college, though. Like, I certainly had to make that leap. I went to, you know, I I was so used to being a student who made straight A's and, like, that was part of my identity. And then, you know, I mean, I did fine in college and grad school. But learning how to let go of being able to tick some boxes and have it work and having to work in something that was a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more gray um, was, I think, probably one of the really more important intellectual jumps of my life do you think that playing games in the classroom actually helps with that it gets people out of a rut just as much as it as anything yeah i, th I think it does in a couple ways i i mean one is it shows a thing that i think you and i know in our bones is that learning is fun um and that lots of people coming into their into college for me like that they, they don't think that but learning is like the grind that, that you've got to do in order to get a degree. Um, so I think that you can enter into a learning experience with joy and emotion and that you can also have bad emotions. You can be frustrated. You can, you can be angry. You can really be furious that your roommate just stabbed you in the back so that he could get this lousy law passed um, that's, that's just wrong on the face of it. Um, so I think that all of that, that emotion and intellect can be combined and that this is positive. I, I think that they get the other thing that I've really consciously tried am trying to do more when I run games is when we're doing the setup, I usually ask, OK, how many of you raise your hand have had a bad experience with group work in a class? And everybody raises their hand. Oh, yeah. And then, terrible. It, right. And then I'm like. Um, do you think that you're never going to have to do group work again ever? And they're all like, well, no, I guess this is a thing that we have to do. So I say, OK, one of the things that we're going to be doing in this game, it's basically group work, right? Uh, you know, you're going to need to work with other people to get laws passed and neutral countries invaded and all those other things that come with this game. Um, there are going to be people that you work with who are slackers. They're going to be people who you work with who don't do the reading. Um, this is about developing coping mechanisms for dealing with that kind of thing when it's when it happens on your team. And the coping mechanism that is most effective is not, I guess I'm going to have to do all the work now, because there's too much work to do in this game for you to be able to do it all. Right. So, so I, I, that increasingly is one of the things that I try to do in a game-based class is to make them better at working in teams, but also able to figure out how to deal with it when their team is not working out. 
because that happens all the time. Yeah. No, I mean, it really does. And, and games, in some ways, become a sort of a safe space to do that. Because you could kind of call somebody out for being a non-contributing member of the Democratic Party because he should be like, you know, getting, showing up for this vote. Um, that's a little bit easier to do than to call out Tom for not contributing his page and a half to the PowerPoint. Right. Um, that's about Tom. But if it's in a game, it's plausibly about the role and you're plausibly criticizing them in role. So I think that it's a little easier to make those criticisms and to try to make those corrections when you're in a game as opposed to when you're in real life. So before we go to the softball questions, I actually want to go back to something that you said I thought was very interesting, um, which was talking about learning and how it can provoke emotion. Mm -hmm. I think that when we talk about coming at something from an intellectual place, we like to imagine that it's coming from an objective place and that it's coming, you know, that being logical means suppressing your emotions and sticking to the facts alone. And so what role do you think that emotion can and should play in a history classroom? And, you know, how are you using your pedagogy to bring that out? Well, I think that it depends, to some extent, it depends on what kind of class you're teaching. I, I think that if I'm teaching an intra level class or a gen ed class, um, I think that having emotion in the mix is entirely appropriate. Because if you can sort of sit there while we're reading documents about the enslavement of human beings and go, well, you know, it is what it is, um, that's deeply problematic to me. <laughs> that you could come at that history and not have an emotional engagement with it, to me means you're not really engaging in the history. You're, mm -hmm. you're engaging in a kind of a superficial names and dates exercise, but you're not thinking about what the lived experience of actual human beings is, which, which to me is, is the flesh and blood of history. I, I think as, as you go up into a higher level class, let's say that it's a class that's mostly majors um, who are getting ready to be teachers or go to graduate school or law school or something like that. I think there, for me, it's a little bit more about monitoring what the emotions are that you're feeling as you're doing the history and thinking about how that might be affecting your analysis and the way that you're reading things. So for example, I'm directing an independent study now, and the independent study is about um, eugenics in Iowa and mm -hmm. the sterilization of, of people um, as a result of the eugenics movement. And the source that the student has found at the State Historical Society is basically this big box full of cards. And on every card, is basically some some kind of standard data about a person name address date of birth iq score um assessment by a medical professional about whether or not they are quote feeble-minded end quote or not and then the decision by the state board about whether this person should be sterilized. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, so the student who's doing this research and I have talked a lot about research practices. She's sort of creating this big database. She's looking at all kinds of sources. Um, I would feel like I'm not doing my job as an instructor and she's not doing her job as a researcher unless we spent some time talking about what the emotional impact of reading those is on her and the degree to which her emotional state affects the way that she reads those documents. Like that you could come into that as a clinician theoretically and just kind yeah. of like read that as data. Um, I think that that is either, it, it either means you're not actually thinking about what you're reading or you're lying 
and you're not as objective as you're pretending to be. Um, so that's a place where I think that the emotion is, uh, is right there and that you have to think about it and talk about it in order to understand what's actually happening in your head uh, uh, in addition to you know, adding one plus one. Yeah, absolutely. So that's heavy, but a really interesting place to kind of take this. So to kind of lighten it back up and kind of cruise to you, <laughs> since I have to take over a bunch of time. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to like drop, no. uh, you know, involuntary sterilization on you in the middle of our nice, our nice talk about games. No, I'm actually, I see, but this is why talking about history is important and not hiding aspects of it is important, right? Like what can you look at and how does it make you feel? Like it's you know it's 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 also important i think to think about it this way because some people probably looked at that and just thought science and that's why you have to have like a full liberal arts education because otherwise you're going to be the doctor who looked at that thing and was like Meh, okay. you know what i mean and kind of moved on instead of thinking like wow that is massively messed up <laughs> well and i think also sort of looking at it in terms of the time and going well why did doctors sign off on this you know like what right. what, what, what was that this looks Kind of obviously awful to us. Um, why did it not look obviously awful to them, or did it look obviously awful to them? And then they went ahead and did it anyway. Yes. Yeah. And I also I think games are interesting in particular because if you're reading about it in the third person, like this this research project sounds so intensely emotional that I don't I don't think you can just about it. But um, you know, some of the issues that you're dealing with in reacting games, especially because it's about clash of ideas, you know, you can't read about something in a book and be like, oh, well, you know, I guess I can kind of see it that way. There's something very visceral, I think, about having to push that vote through, yeah. make that speech, um, you know, form a coalition around an idea and, you know, have to actually make it happen that brings it to life in a new way. Well, and in the reconstruction game that I talked about earlier, I think that there's something that happens at the end of that game, every time that I've run it, where the players either go, we don't have enough military power. The, 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 the white cappers are going to take over the government of Louisiana. We, we, we can't resist them. Or they say, we have enough to hold on for this last round. Some of us are going to die and therefore lose the game. But like, I'm willing to lose the game in order to sort of, make, you know, that that's, that's, I think that if, and it's one of the things we haven't really talked about how reacting games are designed to take place over multiple weeks. Right. I think that if you're playing a one session game, you're not going to have that emotional engagement. But if you've been playing that role and you've been in that world, even if it's only for a few hours a week, um, by the time you get down to that final decision in that game, it is emotionally freighted. And I'm not, I don't ask people to, to pretend that they're feeling the emotions that people did historically. I'm like, you're not. Um, but if you can have a whiff of it, if you can have a taste of it, that that can help you imagine the past in a way that I don't know that you can otherwise. Yeah, I would say that that sounds just about right. So um, you are designing games for the classroom. You're doing really important work. But uh, when you're playing for fun, what are you playing right now? I'm like a 4X gamer um, for, for my kind of uh, leisure gaming. So I, I do it sometimes with friends from college. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I play the, the Total War series. Uh, I play Paradox games, which are these sort of ridiculously complicated grand strategy games. Um, so that's one kind of leisure gaming that I'm doing. So I'm doing kind of three channels right now. So that's one. The other channel is there are a group of people, some of whom I met through reacting and others I met online. Do I have a standing weekly role-playing game date with? So we're playing the Dune universe role-playing game right now, which is fantastic. Um, and a lot of them are gamers of other kinds. Some of them are reacting people. They're not all reacting people. Um, it's good for me to like game with non-historians from time to time. 
um, you know, or who like come up with engineer situations to problems rather than like, let's contextualize it. Um, <laughs> and then I also played board games with my family. Um, my partner and I lately have been playing um, Seven Wonders, the two player version. Yeah. That, which is really fun. Um, and my 16 year old has been playing Scrabble with us if we let him double his score, um, just his base score. So that's cool. And then um, when my daughter is home from university, she's, she's a sophomore right now, um, we play Dune Imperium or Terraforming Mars, both of which are kind of ridiculously complicated, but very engaging games. Not yes. ridiculously complicated. Complicated. <laughs> this sounds like a wholesome family to me. And if people, <laughs> if uh, if people want to find you online, uh, where can you be found? Um, I'm a, sort of. If you look for me at Simpson College, I, I've got a little blurbo on there, and you can email me. I'm um, I'm not with the kids in terms of the tweeting and the such. Uh, I I have a Facebook account pretty much for work. But like I'm an email guy, um, so that I can so that I can write more games. That sounds way more responsible than I'm being right now. <laughs> uh, so for those of you who are out there listening, you probably know hopefully that I am at Beyond Solitaire everywhere, especially the Twitters. Um, <laughs> uh, but Nick, thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful to talk to you and to catch up and to see what you've been working on. All right. Thank you for having me. I, re I really love your show. It's nice to be on it. Fantastic. So for everybody out there, please uh, like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming.